Good afternoon, friends. Warm welcome to each and every one of you for this course titled Prevention and Management of Anterior Segment Complications of VR Procedures. We have heard a lot of comprehensive talks on the posterior segment complications of anterior segment procedures, but there are a few very significant anterior segment problems which can mar the visual recovery in patients who undergo posterior segment procedures. In this instruction course, we will cover a gamut of interesting complications that can occur to the front of the eye in patients who undergo complicated VR procedures. One such complication is the corneal complications which can mar the final visual results and we have Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan. He heads the cornea session at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. I'll be speaking on the anterior segment inflammations, infections, and a few other infections like buccal infection, buccal extrusion, etc. We have Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, the glaucoma consultant at PGA Chandigarh, speaking to us on post vitrectomy glaucomas, a very relevant complication in the era where more and more VR procedures are done, and there are more and more eyes with silicon oil tamponade. We have Arup to speak to us on post vitrectomy cataract. And finally, the last speaker is Dr. Biju, Professor and Head of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Government Medical College, Kollam. He'll be speaking on post vitrectomy, IOL related issues, capsular back contracture, IOL decentration, etc. There is a slight change in the order of presentation. We'll have Arup presenting first. We are also supposed to have a keynote speaker. Dr. Sampath Venkatadiri, as soon as he comes, maybe towards the end of the session, he can make his keynote address. So I request Dr. Arup to come to the dais. So uh, <clears throat> a very good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meena, for conceiving uh, this uh, instruction course concept and having me here. Uh, for the information of uh, the audience here, uh, we have been handling uh, similar uh, situations for the last 30 years or so. I being uh, an anti-segment surgeon and she, my partner, being a post segment surgeon. So we have had the opportunity to handle uh, this post vitrectomy scenarios in, in with in the presence of a large amount of uh, large variation of comorbidities, you know, you name it, and you know, we have had the opportunity to you know t tackle those cases. So my presentation, of course, will be limited to the time allotted, and uh, it is going to be a video-based presentation. And I would like to bring out the salient features, uh, uh, the take-home point through the presentations. Now, uh, I just wanted to know that you know you to know that you know there are certain situations where. You know, in despite of best measures, you can't uh, really achieve, uh, you know, meet your goal. Now, th this was a young patient with silicon oil in the posterior segment and intumescent cataract. And first puncture on the anterior capsule, it ran to the periphery, Argentinian flag sign. So we need to be prepared that, you know, complications can happen and we need to have a decision tree ready as to how to go ahead uh, dealing with those cases. Now, let us see. This was again a posterior segment uh, patient post cataract with emulsified silicon oil in the anterior segment. And globes generally tend to be very soft in these cases. So while making the incision, you sometimes you need to firm up the globe. Otherwise, uh, your tunneling will be very long. 
and then there will be overlocking. So in this particular case, I didn't, I was not able to enter the anterior chamber properly. Uh, let, I wanted a length of two millimeters. So injected BSAs hardened up the eye. So now I have a firmer globe, and then make a desired uh, incision, a clear, temporary clear corneal incision. So the uh, then the silicon oil bubble have to be replaced with uh, BSS and TB tubercle and the trypan blue staining is done. Uh, the endothelium generally tends to be compromised in this scenario because silicon oil bubble has been in the anterior segment for a long period of time. So it is always better to use a soft shell technique and you must use a viscoat. I have no financial interest in the contents of my presentation. So this is what is happening. So after staining the anterior uh, capsule, I am uh, injecting uh, viscoat and after that helon underneath it and uh, please remember that you know in this kind of situations uh, rexis may become troublesome for example sometimes you know the rex there may be fibro you may have fibrotic plaques you know fibrotic bands uh, some of the cases may be subluxated because of uh, a very heavy cataract or because of prior trauma so this is the litmus test first puncture and how it goes it basically determines you know how the rexis is going to happen now, this is a descent rexis so this, and then a cortical cleaving hydrodissection. One has to be very careful while performing cortical cleaving hydrodissection because some of these patients may harbor a pre existing posterior capsular defect only because of the instrument touched to the posterior capsule. So, if you're not careful, if, if I know that there is a defect, you know, I would not use a cortical cleaving hydrodissection. Otherwise, you know, this was a patient done in our center, though the patient came at a very late stage for surgery, which was advised quite early. And we did a cortical cleaving hydrodissection. Lens side is diaphragm retrobartial syndrome or reverse pupillary block is quite well known. So now this is what the strategy that one follows. With the Sinsky hook or maybe with even with the FECO handpiece, you elevate, let me show the step once again, please elevate the iris, lift it off from the anterior capsule so that there is no pressure gradient. As soon as irrigation starts, uh, you will have, see, I'm going gone in in a dry manner. Now, my Sinsky who goes in, raises the iris from the anterior capsule. So now there is, and there's a good communication between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. And once irrigation starts, there is no deepening of the anterior chamber. Otherwise, you will have tremendous deepening of the anterior chamber, overlocking, corneal stria, corneal hydration, uh, difficulties in performing sub incision and maneuvers. So this is the way to avoid it. Now, I didn't go for a direct chop here. So I'm not really sure about the zonular status, status here. So it made, made a deep, you know, uh, kind of a well, went to the bottom of the well and used a chopping technique. This is an oblique uh, chopping that is happening. After you engage the nucleus with the, with the, temp the Chang chopper, initiate the chopping in the periphery and gradually bring it to the center. It is not necessary for you to split the nucleus into two equal halves at this stage itself. Uh, one should use any technique that he or she is comfortable with. Whichever technique in your hands you feel is most uh, you know, capsule zonular friendly. So this is uh, working pretty well. So this is a hardish nucleus, grade, uh, five, grade 4. So I'd split it up into multiple pieces uh, that has been edited out. Towards the end, we have to be careful because these eyes will have, uh, uh, you know, as such, low scleral rigidity. Silicon oil in the posterior segment, a lot of up thrust may be possible. So you can have a PC dent. I'm going to show you a video later on there. So this shining reflex that you see is uh, because of the silicon oil in the posterior segment. There are there is no PC as such, but there are oil droplets which are stuck to the back surface of the posterior capsule. So they cannot be removed by the standard maneuvers. What you just now saw was the spidering pad phenomena where I had momentarily aspirated the posterior capsule. It was, reflux was used and the posterior capsule was taken off, was released from the aspiration port. So in a, I mean, many of these patients will have very aggressive capsular fibrosis, you know, capsular contracture, etc. So we, I also believe in giving a thorough polish both anterior segment, anterior capsule as well as a posterior capsule in these situations. Because capsular back contracture can may be very you know, aggressive here and it may result in oil decentration. I'll come to it now. So here the patient had opted for a hydrophilic acrylic lens. We don't have standard silicon lens available. So never use a silicon lens for these patients, either hydrophobic acrylic or hydrophilic acrylic implanted within the capsular bag. So as I mentioned earlier, these eyes tend to be very soft. So instead of performing extensive stromal hydration, it is always better to close the incision with a, uh, with a tenonylon suture as you see here. Otherwise it is so soft, you know, you keep on hydrating the stroma 
AC becomes deep and the, the stromal hydration takes some time. To, it doesn't look cosmetically nice. So here, Dr. Mina goes in and she, after evaluating the posterior segment, she decided that, yes, the removal of silicon oil was uh, indicated and silicon oil was removed from the posterior segment. So we didn't have to really alter the intraocular lens power uh, in this particular case. In certain situations where the silicon oil is planned to be left in situ for a long period of time, let's say young patient, moribund patient, won't live long, you know, we would like to give them a good vision. So we adjust the intraocular lens power. Maybe Dr. Mina will be talking about it in uh, my next course happening uh, in another halls. So end of the surgery was uneventful. Everything went up pretty well. So uh, now this is another case. This was actually a similar case, you know, with emulsified silicon oil. Now we ask these patients to come for surgery immediately, but for some reason or the other, they, they're usually you know, one eight patient. Somebody has to bring them to the clinic, you know, so they, they take their own time. And the process, all these things happen, you know, the, the silicon oil gets emulsified, part of it comes into the anterior chamber. So we, we are basically a, a tubercle, uh, sorry, the trip and boost staining is done. It is, I think, is a must for these cases because if you encounter a, a capsidic fibrotic plaque or some difficulties, then you have to, you need to have good visibility to ensure that everything is, uh, you know, the, the subsequent steps are done properly. So hydrodesection risks, I've already told, and the way there is a way of taking care of the, uh, you know, the lens iris diaphragm retrobulsion syndrome here. Uh, soft shell technique is again be employed. This is this is something which I cannot overemphasize. You got to protect the corneal endothelium by using a good quality dispersive OVD. And it, this has to be done again and again. You know, repeatedly it might have to be done several times. So Rexis goes on uneventfully for me here and uh, it was good for the high cortical cleaving hydrodesection was done. And even hydrodilution happened, though it was not planned, it, it happened on it, sometimes it happens. And then I don't want to leave behind any epinucleus, epsin, soft, soft cataract, because sometimes if uh, the pupil comes down, if the patient is uncooperative, and if you're doing anatopical, it may be difficult for us to you know, remove the epinucleus. So anyway, the nucleus was chopped, and uh, the, the lens matter was taken out. And uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, the cortical evacuation has to be as complete as possible remove, polish the anterior, back surface of the anterior capsule and whatever elements, fibrotic elements, cellular elements, etc. you see on the posterior capsule, it takes time, sometimes in you know, four minutes, five minutes it takes extra, but I think it is worth it. We don't want to be ending up with a, with a very aggressive capsular back contracture with uh, disentered intraocular lens. And uh, so once that is done, then uh, IOL is uh, implanted. So. So again, as I mentioned, I use uh, a suture to cap to polish, uh, to suture to close the incision. Never use a silicon oil. In fact, these are not available in the market today. So this is something I wanted to watch. You know, this was uh, going on very smoothly, and towards the there was some surge, and usually towards the end of the surgery, uh, when the last, last nucleus has been removed, we lower the parameters, phaco parameters. So this was done. But unfortunately, there was a surge and there was a phaco tip with the touch with the posterior capsule, as you'll see here, and there is a sort of a punched out defect that happens. Now, it is important for you to recognize it early. In that case, you can uh, inject OVD from the side port, never come out of the eye, but it had, I hadn't noticed the punched out defect. When, when I reviewed the video, I realized that there was a defect that happened when I consumed the last bit of nucleus. So it's just a question of pressurizing the globe at the right time. Do not allow the silicon oil uh, to, to come to the anterior segment uh, through the hole that you have created. So when you build up adequate pressure, the silicon oil goes behind, keep the lens in the eye, in the, in the capsular back, and, and surgery gets over smoothly. So I, there are a few take-home points. You know, I mean, you, we perform an optical biometry for all our posterior segment cases. So if patients come to us uh, for cataract surgery, having done vitrectomy elsewhere, we have to perform an acoustic ultrasound that is there. And the optical biometry uh, is archived in the hospital and uh, it is also handed, copy is handed over to, uh, to the patient for safekeeping. Use a good quality intraocular lens for these patients. Some of the recent advances that uh, have uh, modified the way we manage these patients, you know, we always look for the preoperative uh, lens tilt and decentration with the swept source uh, OCT based uh, uh, biometry techniques. And because, as I mentioned earlier, the, there's increased incidence of tilt and decentration in these eyes. The, uh, this incidence is more commonly seen in patients with hydrophilic IL when the rexis is incomplete or there is not, there's no 360 degree overlap. So when this kind of high risk cases, always use a hydrophobic IL. Make sure that rexis is five millimeter, it is well centered, it overlaps the optic. 
do not use an advanced optics intraocular lens in these situations because if these get decentered, invariably you will have, uh, you may have if the patient has good vision, uh, visual potential, visual disturbances. Use a capsule attention ring and some surgeons have failed that if sequential removal and cataract surgery are performed sequentially, you, you can g achieve the target refraction without much refractive error. And uh, again, because flax is becoming very common, so this is a study that I came across. So it concluded that uh, the flax gave bet better results uh, in terms of endothelial cell density, uh, recovery of central corneal thickness, etc. But then this study had limitations. There are hardly in a hard cataract. This is a study titled hard cataracts, challenging cataracts, compressed cataracts, but you know, number of hard cataracts are not sufficient. They're not followed up for a long period of time. And so this paper, and there's another paper that showed that, you know, see, it is not any uh, optical biometer that is going to give good result in silicon oil field eyes. So it has, it, it was clearly shown here that OA2000 by Tomy gives a more accurate axial length compared to uh, IL Master 500 and IL Master 700. So those who are using uh, OA2000, I think will have a better out outcome in, in terms of better, uh, more precise axial length calculation uh, by measurement. So friend, in summary, it is a challenging situation. FACO in vitrectum is dies. I have just touched the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are many multiple ch challenges that may show up in the intraoperative period. You must follow a proper surgical approach. You must have a proper decision tree ready in your mind. So whenever things go haywire, you know how to bring the situation under control. And sometimes even if you do the best of the surgeries, use the best of the lens, patient may not be very happy if patient hasn't been counseled properly the preoperative period because the visual potential for the patient has not been very good. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Arup, for that wonderful uh, talk. We have uh, some change in the keynote speaker. We have Dr. Lalit Verma to deliver the keynote address on uh, experience with Doziba. So if you are ready, please come up onto the dais. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Meena and Dr. Roop, uh, and I thank uh, Partho Biswas for uh, giving this talk on uh, experience with Rani Museum of Biosimilar in this uh, IC by Dr. Meena Chakravarti. So, you see, anti VEGFs have revolutionized the management of uh, plethora of uh, ocular conditions. And today it has become a favorite thera therapy for a whole lot of uh, conditions, including uh, myopic CNVM, ROP also. And uh, we can easily call this era as an era of VEGF inhibitors. It all started with Macugen a long time back. Uh, in fact, Macugen uh, is now no longer available. Then we had uh, Ronnie Mizibab, then uh, uh, Avastin, then ILEA, Flibercept, newer molecules, brolucimab, and so many others are also in the pipeline. But believe me, all this uh, anti vegf inhibitors uh, came to market after a lot of trials, after a lot of trials and data is available. But the issue was of expense and affordability. You see this, uh, when uh, Rani Museum entered the market, it was costing actually more than a lakh of rupee and 2,000 US dollars for single injection. Now, because of competition, the costs have definitely come down and companies are today offering a lot of schemes also. But believe me, it is still expensive. Still expensive, why? Because considering the chronic nature of disease, believe me, we are not treating the disease per se. It is not one-time treatment. It's a recurring treatment month, every month, every four to six weeks. And this increases the treatment burden. And once the treatment burden is increased, patient compliance suffers. They do not get the injection done at a time interval. And as I said, uh, repeated injections are required and we are treating only the effect of the disease. You see, as this lot of uh, studies have shown that there is a general trend towards increased efficacy with increased number of injections. All these studies what are listed here, uh, whether it is RISE, RIDE, Viva, VISTA, so number of injections is the issue. Believe me, goal of any treatment, whether it is RVO, CNVM or DN, 
DME that not only DME should be effective, not only it should have a long lasting value, it should be safe because safety is the first, uh, you know, uh, paramount importance. Plus, if the treatment is not affordable for the masses, it does not uh, stand the test of time. This is where anti vegfs have limitations. There is no doubt they are very effective, but problem is they work for some time. Again, again, injections are required because it's not a finite treatment. So with anti vegf it is something like keep injecting, 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 and something like what we see this movie Lagera Munna Bhai. And the real world experience also tells us less than 50 percent of the people get more than five injections. This was the luminous study, you know, long time back data got available. The compliance becomes an issue and it's injection. A lot of time my patients will come with a chart, Dr. Sop, kitne injection or lagenge? how many more injections will you give? And sometimes believe me, our integrity is at stake. They start thinking that is if, as if I am giving for my own benefit. Every time patient comes, there is an OCT done, every time consultation has to be paid and then injection has to be given. And this becomes very important, uh, not only patient is financially exhausted, but mentally exhausted also. Because remember, patient does not come alone, he is accompanied by relatives also. And 2005 was an era of biosimilars. You see, the biosimilars, they came to market the, with the biggest uh, projected advantage of cost effectiveness. And I remember uh, in American Academy, this was quoted uh, for one of the biosimilar that if they come, they will lower the cost and maybe a vast end will be out of the market and this will be used. The reason is that not only is the cost of injection to the, to the patient per se, number of injections, travel of the patient, visit cost, relative cost and consultation imaging. If you compound all these things, yearly cost comes to nearly more than 2 lakhs of rupees uh, or maybe 2.5 lakhs of rupees for this innovative molecule of uh, ranimizumab. But entered this biosimilar market, the cost does come out and the if you calculate this, patient gets a benefit of nearly 40 to 50 percent. And there is a biosimilar boom and if you see even in US, there have been you know more than 31 approved biosimilars and recently the BioVis as well as the similarly, they got approved in US uh, last year. And according to this report, the year uh, is this year is set to be a turning point in the in the biosimilar market. So biosimilars when they come, as I said, uh, not only have to be safe because safety as per uh, uh, you know our practice has to be foremost. Then comes all this efficacy approvals and costing. And this was one biosimilar where, uh, you know, which, uh, which we had a lot of experience and I show a couple of patients here who had the benefit, but entered another biosimilar. And this was by the name of Osiva and uh, we always want to try all these uh, drugs because ultimately we want to minimize the cost to the patient. And that is the whole, uh, you know, uh, reason behind it. I'll share a couple of examples of this new biosimilar which entered the market uh, last year, in fact. This was one patient who received one injection. The diagnosis here was a variant of AMD, what we call fee pad or flat irregular pigment cell detachment. Vision patient got maintained. There are no adverse effect, no vitritis was noticed. This is another patient of proliferative dietary retinopathy along with maculopathy. And you see this patient uh, received this injection. The injection received was on 8th and in one day, you see how much uh, this got affected. And subsequently, this patient did maintain the central macular thickness of 78. We started with 407. This was another diabetic patient, left eye. This patient had had uh, evidence of traction also as is seen in OCT. Plus his OCT was very high, more than uh, nearly 500. And this patient did get this injection and we ultimately did vitectomy also. So this patient had element of traction also, but a very happy patient at the end of it vision improved from 6 by 60 to 6 by 24 in fact now at the last follow up this was a patient of uh, armd cnvm wet kind of armd and you notice this uh, central macular area where you have uh, you know type uh, 2 cnvm with thickness of nearly 200 and this patient received an injection and on the first day itself there was some effect and then uh, subsequently if you notice this shrim material has got organized and the, mic, uh, the thickness was around 98 and vision was 6 by 24. This is another diabetic patient actually landed up with NVG and had rubiosity iridis also. This patient, uh, we gave this injection uh, on 20th 
and this patient you see the miraculous response from nearly 759 to less than around 300 and this patient ultimately had a vision of 6 by 36 you see gaining 6 by 36 in a patient of NVG is uh, is a very good uh, uh. subsequently however this same patient received another injection of uh, because he had a rebound and again second injection was given and this patient responded nicely so till date we have used around 32 patients but here i am presenting data of 17 injections because the follow up is complete only in this and this bar diagram shows the pre and post effect but this is more illustrative we mean visual equity from 0.6 to 0.61 and this subfoveal thickness in these patients, pre-injection and post-injections have been tabulated here for this uh, subgroup of patients. And this is the effect in the subretinal thickness. So thus to conclude by saying, safety, efficacy, and approvals costing, all this, you know, biosimilars have to go through this process. And for me, as well as for the patients, biosimilars are a delight. In fact, they are a savior for both patients and doctors and they do result in cost reduction for the patients. And is it only the cost we are, which we are asking for? It's not only the cost, but it's a comparable efficacy to, uh, you know, the innovator molecule or the principal molecule plus the safety. And what we lack today in this country is data. Because data, data and data ultimately will convince everybody about the usage of this biosimilar. And this becomes relatively more important if you realize the magnitude of the problem this country may face. Today, uh, the anti market is more than one crore of patients who require these injections. So, if somebody else is paying like panel patient or CGHS, it does not matter to the patient. But if patient is paying of its own pocket, all these issues become very, very relevant. So, where are we now? My take on this is it's a, it's a now a race to win the money pot because a lot of these companies, you know, are promoting uh, strategies like ILEA for you or port delivery and uh, more biosimilars are entering with, uh, with a lot of promises. But choice is all ours only. How do we use it? How do we, you know, uh, make it affordable to the patient? And But believe me, we should consider economic factors and use this agent judiciously. And biosimilars are as efficacious as uh, as uh, innovator molecule and sometimes we interchangeably use also because aim is that we have to give maximum benefit to the patient ultimately it's going to be a price war between all these biosimilars which are entering or which will enter in the market and we have to uh, you know utilize them for the maximum benefit of our patients thank you very much uh, for listening thank you so much Thank you, sir, for that excellent presentation. I have a question for you. How frequently would you repeat the injections? How frequently? Would you repeat the injections? You see, in, depending on the disease, uh, ARMD, we do re have a concept of loading dose. And after that, majority, in more than 90% of patients, I shift them to treat an extent kind of regimen, where we keep extending the interval by two weeks every time. And if uh, they keep improving, then maximum interval I've gone is around eight to 10 weeks. And uh, in diabetes, uh, sometimes it is not a loading dose, but it's a PRN kind of treatment. Diabetes being a multifactorial disease, we have to pay attention to other metabolic factors, including hypertension, lipid profile, hemoglobin, all this thing has to be considered. So we do give initial doses. After that, uh, these patients, uh, you know, PRN kind of treatment for them, I normally report to. There, I do not insist on, uh, you know, because the VEGF load in diabetes is not very, very high compared to ARMD. ARMD, I am uh, very, you know, uh, rigid about this, that these patients have to be on maintenance dose of anti-VEGF. Where diabetes, once the, all these uh, metabolic parameters come under control, the requirement is virtually on a PRN basis rather than any fixed regimen. Say it again. Efficacy is comparable. Efficacy is absolutely okay. And that's the reason we sh actually shifted from Avastin. The role of biosimilars ultimately will be to replace Avastin, which is a non-approved. But these biosimilars, whether it is, uh, you know, this uh, Oceva, they have got FDA approval now. FDA of India, DCJ has approved them. And that gives us confidence to use that. You see, Avastin is a good molecule. A lot of people still use Avastin. But Avastin cannot protect you in court of law because it is not an approved molecule. Whereas this molecule, Oceva, it has been approved by DCGI. 
so therefore if efficacy is similar i to save my skin i would definitely go for a approved molecule rather than a, a off label molecule sir please use the mic the sessions are recorded please use, use the mic you can use the mic sir you can come on to the mic no you can ask acha aise you can ask yes yes madam what is your personal experience of maximum number of injections in a diabetic as well as in any uh, macular degeneration patient armd is the record i have is 62 62 injections i have given and in one vascular block patient uh, i have given around 36 and how much duration so in armd as i said 90% of the patients ultimately they get every uh, 8 to 10 weeks in armd or sometimes in armd sometimes say it yes so 15 years say it again in your macular degeneration patient within how many years you have given the 62 injections 10 years or 15 years uh must be around uh, i don't know i can't tell you but around 8 7 8 10 years also and in these patients have a very rigid schedule of follow up and in diabetes. diabetes the number of injections are much much less much much less because you see i scare these patients that unless you control because diabetes is coming from the blood in case they control all these things the number of injections do tend to come down and sometimes we add laser to this patient to make the treatment more finite also it's not in diabetes you see and in in armd we are totally dependent on injections in pcv we are dependent on injections but in diabetes there are additional things like uh, you know systemic control as well as lasers are there so number of injections in diabetes is lesser thank you thank you plus thank there are newer molecules also coming up yes madam thank you very much i think i'll have to carry on with the session so is available for discussion with you he will speak okay. to you thank okay. you very much i request dr sushmita to come to the dais thank you sir good afternoon at the outset i thank aios and dr meena and dr arup for having me on their course Uh, so the topic was post-op hypotony and recalcitrant glaucoma following retinal surgeries. Uh, the slides aren't moving. Yeah. So uh, coming to the hypotony bit first, it's not as common after PPV, and the definitions include a statistical definition where the IOP is less than six millimeters, which is more than three standard deviations below the mean IOP. But a clinical definition is an IOP low enough to result in visual loss. So sometimes you do have pressures which are low, but if there's no clinical significance of that low pressures, you decide to just wait and watch. The causes usually are sclerostomy site leakage or postoperative inflammation. Those are the common causes. The incidents I found this paper of 122 consecutive cases, and they actually reported 13 percent of hypotony after 25 gauge vitrectomy. but all resolved by one week so we're not sure whether this really resulted in clinically significant hypotony or not but in their paper the patients who had reoperations or were combined with cataract surgery or were pseudo phakic or had intravitreal triumphs and non surprisingly were more prone to hypotony the late hypotony is what we are worried about and that's the one which usually causes a clinically significant Uh, decreased vision so this case for instance i borrowed this from dr raman a retina colleague his 37 year old man with a bull horn injury with an open globe injury had a retinal incarceration with a zone 3 injury and underwent a ppl ppv and silicon oil tamponade four years later he had a, a bcva of 20 by 200 but an iop of 6 mm of mercury and the issues that uh, were thought of at that time was hypotony due to increased scleral outflow and repeated erm formation so once that that cause was taken care of and the erm was removed this uh, pressures got better and his uh, vision also improved so the management principles really are to avoid large retinectomies keep oil for a long time maybe 5000 cm strokes would do try difluprid or depo steroids and if a cyclitic membrane develops in a long standing inflammation consider removal but with a caveat that the results are rather disappointing they don't do too well 
IOP rise following posterior segment surgery is a far more common problem. So you could have an early post-op IOP elevation, which is more likely to have a persistent IOP increase for at least six weeks. SF6 or C3 F8 gas or silicon oil, scleral buckles and inflammation. All of these could be causes of a early post-op rise. Later, surprisingly, it is prolonged corticosteroid use, which we don't think about. So we just write a steroid and then they're on it for a long, long, long time. And uh, it just happens that they haven't taken it off. And damage to the trabecular meshwork because of the PPV or because of the primary problem. So the risk factors for post-PPV glaucoma, there's this nice case control study you can go through. Patients who required a glaucoma drainage device after VR surgery versus patients who underwent VR surgery without a subsequent device. So they actually co did this cohort comparison and they found that the ones who required a drainage device, which is the ones who, were, who had recalcitrant glaucoma, were younger, they were more often men. They had more interventions. They were treated with silicon oil. They had a higher intraocular pressure one week after surgery. And they also had a history of glaucoma. So if you have a history of glaucoma and a deranged trabecular meshwork, those are the ones intuitively which you need to watch out for to have persistent IOP. For some reason, the slides are moving on their own. Something is happening anyway. So the broad management principles are medical management. And an acute rise sometimes may require buckle removal or a buckle cutting. And of course, silicon oil or gas removal. And a chronic rise would require surgery, usually a glaucoma drainage device. So this would be the usual treatment course. Medical management is first line, but the IOP level and vision guide the plan. You don't want to go into an eye too early, especially an eye which has undergone PPV because it's a, it's a tough eye to operate for glaucoma because the conjunctiva is not friendly to you. If it's less than 30 millimeters of mercury and good and moderate vision, it's usually treated medically and it's amenable. If it's poor vision, it's nice to use a limited diode laser cyclophotocoagulation that works well. If it's more than 30 millimeters and moderate vision, they usually land up with surgery or again a limited DLCP, which is not so bad. Poor vision, usually you would go on to a cyclophotocoagulation as a first choice. So in these eyes, hypotony is more ominous because it may trigger a redetachment. So you're very scared of doing a DLCP without it being limited because hypotony can be detrimental. So the options are uh, glaucoma drainage device is useful because they're often very high risk eyes, as I said, and they have scarred conjunctiva. Uh, one study showed failure occurred in 20%, complications in 20%, and severe complications in yet another 20%. So only about 40% of patients were trouble-free. An inferior place DDD is difficult, but it avoids the migration of emulsified particles when you put it superiorly, so it's a good thing to do if you have a silicon oil. And tube placement in sulcus is safer for the cornea. It's easy if it's after cataract surgery, but not so difficult, not so easy in a fake patient. If you have pre-existing glaucoma, you could combine a PPV and a tube because invariably those are the eyes which are going to land up with recalcitrant rise later. The problem is if you have an existing encirclage or scleral buckle. So this is a case with a pre-existing encirclage band. It's difficult to dissect it under the muscles and place a drainage device in the presence of a band. So this one-year-old, 14-year-old boy who'd lost one eye to a blast injury, the other eye had cataract surgery and then recurrent RD and then underwent a PPV. So his best corrected vision is 624. Pressures are 44 and very little money left. So we had, we requested Orolab, they gifted us with an Adi for us to put in. Now I'll just show you how difficult it gets to dissect under the muscle. When we need to do an Adi, an Adi by the way is an Orolab aqueous drainage implant, analogous to the bar welt, which is valveless, but it's big. So if you have a, a, a band in situ, what's wrong with this? Okay. Right, so why is this stopping? The video Anyway, I'll move forward. Let's see. Right, so the idea is just to show that it all looks very hunky-dory to start with, and yet you struggle and struggle and struggle to get beneath the muscle. 
because the Adi implant has to go beneath it. So I'll just move forward. We kept searching. We didn't even find where the muscle was and finally we did and you can see the amount of fibrosis there and there is the encerclage band. So there, there is the band again. So somehow or the other you do manage to create a space between the band and the, the muscle and you fit in your drainage device there. It looks very, very gory. But ultimately, you do manage to secure the plate and then you insert the tube as usual. But three months post-op, the intraox, so this is an inferior band because there was silicone oil. Um, the pressures are 12 on timolol. Always keep them on timolol to be on the safer side. And the conjunctiva is flat. You can see it's much better than an AGV. So it's so much easier if you have an affording patient who would get an AG AGV, for instance. So right eye TRD with PVR operated, but no visual gain and hand motion. So left eye, he had PVR again. So he had a PPV with encerclage, silicone oil, intractable glaucoma, emulsified oil, removed twice, extensively scarred conjunctiva, pressure stays at 56, but one eyed patient with 624 vision. So here is the sort of initial shortening that you see, and the conjunctiva is as scarred as that. So you retrieve, the, the important thing is to retrieve the retina uh, notes. So you ask your retina colleague, they tell me if you have a diagram or you have details of what you've done. So it tells us where and what they did, and sure enough, there was a 240 encircling band and the details of surgery there. So you can place what you want. Now, this patient mercifully could afford a, uh, an AGV, an amid glaucoma valve. So the amid valve is 250 millimeter square, so it's smaller, and you don't need to dissect out under the muscle. So the easy thing to do is to dissect out wherever the buckle or the band is, and then go in and just push the, the device behind it, and the tube comes over it. So it's easy to implant, and there we are. It's so much easier, and this is inferior. That's why this is the surgeon's view. So again, an inferior because of the silicone oil. And by the time we finished this, the silicone oil came up in front of the lens. So any sort of disturbance and the oil can come out anytime. So we had to go in and flush it out and lavage it from the anterior segment. So you can see that bit of inverse hypopion in sight of us lavaging out the silicone oil, but this is next day. The pressures are good. This is the tube in place. But it's much easier to use a valved smaller device. Now you have the, uh, the non-valved Ahmed clear path, 250 millimeter square with a rip cord. So maybe th that will make our lives much better. Now, sometimes one is not enough. You do one and then the pressures are still not high, are still not controlled, and then you do the second. So there are some patients who are walking around with a band, with a buckle, with two plates in the eye. I have no idea how long they're going to survive. Silicon oil can be very troublesome. A big bubble re needs uh, removal preoperatively, of course. Sometimes they leak out of the conjunctival incision. And these are the problems we've seen with superior tubes. You actually have silicon oil coming out of a little bit of an incision that's made. Uh, we've seen silicon oil around the tube. So these are, these are patients who had nothing pre-op and then you do the surgery and then suddenly you see it blocking. And you can see these emulsified bubbles. These are inside the tube. So there's a big bubble at the mouth of the tube and silicone oil inside. So there's no point doing a second surgery and a third surgery if you don't see why the pressure is rising. So, of course, this one just requires a removal more than anything else. And I think finally, th this was a very interesting video, the journey of a silicone oil inside the eye and why this, the pressure rises. And look at this. We were just doing a UBM for something. And suddenly we realize that these are the convection currents of the emulsified silicone oil. So they go and they sit in the trabecular meshwork and they get stuck there and they just go round and round the eye. So they just have to be out. Sometimes tube migration is a problem. So this, uh, again, this patient, we have a lot of these one-eyed ones, coloboma, RD, and then left eye thysis after a PPV, right eye PP, post-PPV glaucoma. And now they're gifted to us. Now it's your baby. So BCFE of 660, 44 millimeters, we did the Adi, six months later, again looked out at the six months later, the tube migrated towards the pupil and then you had to trim it. So you go in and you trim the pupil and now the pressures are all right. Sometimes an ex extensively scarred uh, conjunctiva precludes a glaucoma drainage device. Transillumination is very, very important to do DLCP, especially in 
patients who have had multiple surgeries. It's very easy. We use a pen torch and we use gentian violet paint, delineate the anterior end of the ciliary body and do the laser there. And believe me, your hypotenuse and predictabilities are absolutely taken care of. And we now routinely do transillumination in all our patients. So post PPV scl scleral buccal glaucoma is a difficult entity. Many times it's the only seeing eye. GDD implantation is usually required. But for posterior segment pathology and glaucoma, combined PPV and a drainage tube implantation may be a better alternative. But sometimes a guarded transcleral cyclophotocoagulation may be a less invasive and a better, safer procedure. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Shushmita, for that excellent presentation. I think we have a few questions, but we will be taking that towards the end. Next, I'll be inviting the chairperson of this session, Dr. Meena Chakravarti, for her talk on anterior segment inflammation, including anterior segment necrosis. Over to you, ma'am. Mic is on. Okay, thanks. I'll be speaking on anterior segment infections, inflammations, and a few other miscellaneous conditions that commonly occur in the anterior segment following a complicated posterior segment procedure. So let us look at these two patients. Both of them are 65 year old. Both of them have undergone a diabetic pass planar vitrectomy. One of them has a silicon oil tamponade, and you see two entirely different clinical presentations in the first post-operative week. One has a post-vitrectomy endophthalmitis and the other one has a post-vitrectomy, a posterior segment fibrin syndrome or the post-vitrectomy TAS syndrome. If you look at the incidence of post-vitrectomy endophthalmitis, when we were shifting over from the 20 gauge sutured surgery to the transconjunctival sutureless vitrectomy, during that era from 2002 to about 2006 or seven, there was an increase in the incidence of post vitrectomy endophthalmitis. This could be our learning curve when we were learning how to put in the transconjunctival sutureless sclerotomy. It could be related to the techniques and technology involved. And subsequently, there has been a decline and the incidence is very less now. The incidence in the Indian scenario is about 0.02% to 0.08%. The risk factors are a complicated VR procedures, multiple instrument exchanges, longer operating times, a combined procedure, poor wound healing in a diabetic patients. When vitrectomy is performed for a vascular retinopathy, a phaco vitrectomy. And interestingly, the absence of silicon oil tamponade or a gas tamponade is a risk factor for development of post vitrectomy endophthalmitis. This could be because of the fact that the differential surface tension of the tamponading agent seals the wound. Well, when there is balanced salt solution in the eye, the wound is likely to leak, become hypotonus, and vitreous wick can prolapse through the wound, which acts as a needus for post vitrectomy infections. If you look at the percentage of uh, leaking sclerotomies following a sutureless small gauge vitrectomy, about 38 percentage of cases we still do have to suture the wound or resort to other means such as application of diathermy or cryo to the wound to make the wound lips edematous so that it seals on its own. The clinical presentation of post vitrectomy endophthalmitis is a little different from post cataract surgery endophthalmitis intact. You, the patient presents usually within less, maybe on the first post operative day itself, usually less than one week following the surgery. The reaction is associated with a lot of fibrin formation in the anterior chamber of corneal edema, and sometimes you do see that the sclerotomy site is necrosed. The patient may either have hypertony or hyperto hypertony or hypotony. The responsible organisms are also different. While it is a gram-positive staph epidermidis, which is responsible for the post-cataract endophthalmitis, we, here we have the fulminant gram-negative infections, especially the enterobacteria infections, the E. coli, Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas, and fungal infections. In our country, we tend to reuse the disposable instruments to cut down the cost for our patients, and this was a very elegant study a multi-centered study conducted by the Bitter Retinal Society of India, which showed that there was no significant difference in the incidence of post vitrectomy endophthalmitis, even when the instruments were reused, either based on the perform of its performance 
based and when the in instrument was not performing properly they discarded the instrument or in some centers after the instrument was used for a specific number of times it, they tend to discard it, the instruments irrespective of reuse of the instrument it was found that there was no significant difference in the incidence of post vitrectomy and ophthalmitis this is one of my patient with tas the silicon oil in situ had undergone a complicated vitrectomy for a retinal detachment with proliferative vitreo retinopathy it tends to occur on the first post operative day itself with limbus to limbus corneal edema and a lot of fibrin in the anterior chamber this is called the toxic posterior segment syndrome well previously we called this for several years as a fibrin syndrome or sterile endothelitis the onset is usually on the first post operative day with severe visual blurring absent conjunctival congestion there is no pain usually and uh, presence of plenty of fibrin in the anterior chamber the risk factors for uh, tpss could be similar to tas it could be procedure related or process related there is extensive cryo or cyclodestructive procedures when we use poor quality silicon oil earlier in earlier when good quality silicon oils were not available we used to see a lot of tas If you have the suspicion of NAS or an endophthalmitis, you keep the patient in the OP. Use topical antibiotic and steroid. Observe the patient for a period of three hours. If you see that if he is getting better, you continue treatment with the steroids. Otherwise, it's always better to err on the side of infection and go in for a vitreous tap or biopsy and inject intravitreal antibiotics. The sequelae of TAS is. Uh, chronic inflammation damage to the trabecular meshwork and glaucoma endothelial damage resulting in a decompensated cornea a fixed dilated pupil and severe cystoid persistent cystoid macular edema the processes involved could be with, while you in your sterilization process so it is always better to take a look at your sterilization process once in a while and see that everything is in place cannulated instruments are used in vitreo retinal surgery also and even the micro vitreo retinal forceps and the scissors that we use do have lumen inside and the mug that collects in gets voided into the vitreous cavity because of the difference in pressure the pressure inside the eye is much higher than the atmospheric pressure so this mug viscoelastics pfcl residual silicon oil gets flushed into the vitreous cavity and can be responsible for tas the management is steroids through all routes intraocular pressure monitoring is necessary if your patient is not responding once again i emphasize that it is better to err on the side of infection and go in for a vitreous biopsy and intravitreal antibiotic injection these are a few other infections that you see this is a patient who has a sclerotomy site necrosis a scleritis at that site at, with the gaping of the wound and subsequently it healed on its own leaving behind a small area of thin sclera through which you can see the uveal tissue prolapsing out this is another patient whom i operated about 20 years back who came to me recently with an extruding buckle buckle infection and what looked to me like a, a scleral an abscess which i drained in the in the in my op itself and but his problem was that he was having severe pain the pain was disproportionate to the inflammation that he had in the eye and subsequently after buccal removal and a course of systemic antibiotic and steroid his eye quieted down what he had was a post uh, surgical sins surgical scleral, scleral necrosis syndrome and this is another such patient who had recurrent inflammation a one eyed man a high myopic patient who had recurrent scleral scleritis in the post operative period and this is the area of thinning that he has with protrusion of the uveal tissue which he subsequently underwent a patch graft in that area if you look at the various causes which are responsible as surgically in induced scleral necrosis it can vary from trauma infectious pathology ischemia toxicity but most importantly to us as posterior segment surgeon it's it is usually a very tight buckle which compresses the posterior ciliary circulation and causes ischemia in the anterior segment or excessive use of diatherme especially in long time back when we did an implant we dissected the sclera and then we placed diatherme on the scleral bed in staggered rows and those kind of patients were likely likely to develop sins in the post operative period here again is it is better to rule out infections especially bacterial fungal and atypical mycobacterial infection and treat the patient accordingly 
for all non infectious pathology you upgrade the treatment starting the treatment with uh, topical and systemic non steroidal and anti inflammatory agents to systemic steroids to anti metabolites and anti and biological agents if the patient is not responding and as a last resort the sclera is debrided and you put a patch graft whatever said and done the patient suffers terribly to see patients whom you have done a very good surgery who is an attached retina they are no longer bothered about their visual recovery what they are bothered about is a severe pain that they have in the post operative period this is another situation that is commonly seen when your explant suture gives way and the buckle starts migrating forward anteriorly it comes under the extra ocular muscle and sometimes it may cheese fire through the muscle and come very close to the limbus and these bu these buckles usually get extrude through the conjunctiva ultimately get infected and they have to be removed here you can see a sponge ex extruding in the same way suture related granuloma and implantation cysts are other minor complications easy to tackle but they they distress the patient who has undergone a prolonged procedure in the post operative period this is again a post vitrectomy i who had a leaking sclerotomy despite closure of the sclerotomy with the suture and you can see that the silicon oil has migrated under the conjunctiva and you can see sago greens like appearance of the conjunctiva this again it's very difficult if you try to remove these silicon oil bubbles because they are encysted in the tenons capsule and they do not come out so it's better to leave it alone for the newcomer or a fresher who is doing vitreoretinal surgery there is something called the pools rule when you tighten the encircling encirclage while you are uh, doing an explant to achieve about 2 mm shortening you cut the band about 13 mm this is a rule that all of us should follow otherwise if you have a, if your drainage is not complete and there is still a lot of fluid present in the vitreous cavity your natural tendency is to tighten the band and you get an hourglass globe and this is responsible for anterior segment ischemia we rarely see anterior segment ischemia now previously there were a lot of such cases but because of too much tightening of the encirclage now with the advent of vitrectomy scleral buckling is a procedure which has become almost obsolete and we rarely see this complication this can also cause severe band pain in the patient a chronic aching kind of pain at the back of the eye where sometimes necessitate that you cut the band and leave it back in the eye so these are some of the complications that can anterior segment complication that can occur in posterior segment surgery and i thank you very much for your patient hearing would you like to speak next biju or anil is ready welcome anil next dr anil radhakrishnan will be speaking on conjunctival and corneal complications Okay, since Dr. Anil's presentation is getting lower, I think I will go ahead with mine. So it's on management of PCO, then descended eye oils in the postoperative period. Okay, so the chance of encountering a posterior catheter opacification in the postoperative period is much more in patients undergoing uh, combined or sequential cataract surgery and vitrectomy than in patients undergoing cataract surgery alone. And there are a lot of reasons for that, including increased postoperative inflammation, then loss of compression of the vitreous body, effect of the tamponade, and the changes in oxygenation due to the uh, changes in the vitreous dynamics. I'm not going through the details of all these things. So, I just uh, go through a few cases. So this was a case of a retinal detachment which was managed by vitrectomy and silicone oil. and uh, during undergoing cataract surgery by sics so this is the picture after the cortical wash so you can see there's a thick plaque or posterior capsular opacification there so which has been as a result of probably by the action of the silicone oil so 
this patient anyway is going to uh, we need to do something about the postural capsular opacification immediately in the postoperative period so our my choice would be generally to do a primary postural capsulotomy at the time of the cataract surgery itself and if it is time for the oil removal probably take out the oil at that time itself because it's going to be a little difficult when you are doing yak capsulotomy because many of these uh, postural capsular opacification uh, the uh, opacification will be quite thick but however if it is not like that and if you think that can be managed by yak capsulotomy that can also be done so this is a uh, another such case again you can see that uh, there is already oil inside so after the cataract surgery during the cortical wash itself and just trying to scrape and remove the uh, postural capsular fibrosis but it's very difficult and you can see it is quite tough so this is these cases are going to be difficult if you try to manage with the yak capsulotomy but if it is thin of course you can uh, leave it and probably manage it by by, by a yak capsulotomy but this case again a posterior primary posterior capsulotomy along with silicone oil removal was done so this is again another case because many of these cases you can see that this is also a case which was were uh, it was done for a, a detachment surgery so it is always many of the, many many a time we see that there is always a, a, a pc ren because that ren may be the primary cause of the rd itself so here also after the cataract i mean cataract removal you can see there is a large ren which was pre existing and it is quite fibrosed also so i'm just removing the oil through the uh, that opening itself and you can see that uh, because of it is so fibrous that even after the oil is coming out that opening is remaining almost the same and it is having enough posterior capsular support so you can put in a uh, rigid pcil also so this is just to uh, sort of demonstrate a few cases that how the posterior capsule can be fibrous and opacified because of the presence of the oil or in these cases and how frequently we need to manage such cases in the postoperative period now the second one which is more common is of course the descended iol which is quite common because uh, you know during the vitreoretinal procedures we generally end up doing a lot of manipulations uh, like the scleral depression then iris manipulation then iris retractors then there will be the effect of the taminate the gas bubble silicone oil which will have some effect on the iol and there will be some amount of decentration and sometimes if there is a sort of a pre existing rent like in the case of a for example a case done for an rd etc then it can lead even to a dislocations also and uh, another cause is increased capsular fibrosis which can sometimes happen in the postoperative period as explained already and sometimes this capsular fibrosis can be so intense as to push the iol out of the bag or decenter it completely so because of all these reasons so it is very common to encounter such complications in the postoperative period now so in such cases what are the management options and how to choose so the deciding factors will be the other ocular comorbidities like the iris and capsular anatomy the surgeon's preference and the surgical plan would be probably first about repositioning the same iol and if that is not possible an iol exchange then secondary iol placement sometimes and the procedure it will be depending upon the surgeon's choice you can go for either a scleral fixation using a gotex sutured pc iol or you can go for a sutureless scleral fixation For PCL by using a glued IOL or the other methods, and uh, the iris claw, which would be much more simpler and uh, much more quicker method in in some hands. Now this is uh, a picture from the uh, literature just to show how the intact capsular bag has undergone a lot of fibrosis, resulting in decentration. And here the management would be probably to visco dissect, separate the leaves. of the capsule and reposition the iol itself now this is again a case of a, a detachment where i'm just uh, doing the fluid air exchange and after fluid ex air exchange while the air is being exchanged with the oil and once you come out of and examine the anterior chamber you can see that the iol is decentered 
This happens because there is always, again, there is a rent there because there was a reason for the uh, RD in the primary place. So through that run, the oil has come anteriorly and there is of course some displacement of the IOL. But it is not uh, so much asked to, uh, asked, asked to call for an IOL exchange or anything. You can just take out, take it, I mean, with the, with the, with the Sinsky who you can easily reposition it and that was what was done. And this is the usual scenario in most of the cases, which, uh, but there may be some cases like this where you will have it to uh, think of suture fixation of the one haptic so as to stabilize the IOL or even think of the IOL exchange. So it will be done on a case by case basis. And this is another case where uh, following again it was a uh, vitrectomy done for an RRD in silicone oil. Following the silicone oil removal then the patient uh, came back with this sort of a scenario. He had a fall also so whether it was the primary it happened during the oil removal or due to the fall, probably due to a combination. Now the IOL is in this sort of a situation where you can see that the haptic is hooked on the iris and the, uh, the optic is dangling down. So what was done, done in this case was that uh, the IOL was just taken out through a incision, a keratome incision, 3.2, I mean a large keratome incision, six, almost about 6 mm. So it is just being taken out. But there is sufficient that of the capsular rim still remaining in order to support the an, an IOL. So I thought maybe uh, there was no need for actually going for a scleral fixation of iris claw. So in another PMME IOL itself of the same power was actually placed on the rim. And uh, it was found to be reasonably stable also. So due to some sort of uh, manipulation during that primary vitrectomy, probably due to my fault itself, this must have happened. So now it is stable. And again, this was a case of actually a post-nucleus drop vitrectomy and iris claw implantation. The only thing is that in the post-operative period, it was found that the iris claw also got dislocated. So it was again found, you can see the iris claw actually lying on the retina now. And uh, there's no vitreous, so again, the procedure. So it can be easily, uh, you, I mean, I'm, I'm just using the silicon dipped cannula and an act, active suction in order to just lift the iris claw anteriorly. And it is being held and uh, by a uh, sort of handshake method, it is being transferred into the other IOL holding forceps and is taken out. So in such cases, we generally uh, use another iris claw because probably there is something wrong with the initial claw. So another iris claw is being uh, used and uh, that is being actually fixated there. So since there is no vitreous interfering with any of this, this procedure goes very smoothly and very fast. Okay, that is it. This is another picture just to show another case where I dislocated IOL after an incomplete silicon oil fill. So to conclude, post vitrectomy, I mean, we get the increased incidence of PCOs and IOL decentrations and we take maximum care in order to avoid this by careful use of tamanate and timely removal of the tamanate depending on the case, avoiding excessive manipulations, then care during scleral depression, vitreous based shaving, tamarind, etc. But in spite of all these things, this happen and in such cases, timely and optimal management can give the patient optimal vision. Thank you. Thank you, Biju, for that very nice presentation. Our last speaker for the day is Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan. He'll be speaking on corneal complications related to posterior segment surgery. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, so I just want to show one case. This man was uh, planned for a epiretinal membrane surgery. The vision was 6 by 12. 
uh, and the uh, the treating retina doctor uh, their residents had seen the patient to rule out dry eye they had done the schumer's test which was more than 10 millimeters so because there is a corneal scar in the inferior part they send it to the cornea department and when we saw the patient if you look at it carefully you can see that the posterior lid margins are abnormal uh, there is some trichiasis uh, then uh, if you see the mebumin glands it's it's very much uh, reduced you know the numbers are very very low so that is very consistent with the diagnosis of steven johnson syndrome you don't need this to diagnose it but still i'm saying so this patient actually the dry eye has to be treated pretty well before you think of any surgery uh, the ocular surface is something that is basically remaining within the lids it includes lids all the different glands in the lids the conjunctiva palpebral uh, fornician and bulbar uh, the various lacrimal glands the main and accessory lacrimal glands uh, obviously the other uh, cornea also and there is something called a lacrimal function unit it, it uh, it's a bit scary but uh, we should understand that the, it is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve carrying pulses from the ocular surface and it goes to the midbrain then the efferent pathway is from the superior salivary nucleus which uh, exits through the the geniculate ganglion and sinopalatine ganglion and reaches the ocular surface so the amount of uh, impulses efferent impulses actually determine the amount of efferent impulses so there is a fine delicate balance between the two and that can be disturbed in a lot of conditions a lot of people normally are in a somewhat dicey balance and when you have some disturbance to the surface uh, this can go haywire if you look at the uh, tf film it contains a lot of things other than just tears other than the aqueous part you know it has a lot of uh, electrolytes lysozyme lactoferrin a variety of growth factors cytokines and very importantly mucins and uh, the uh, three layer theory of uh, lacrimal fluid is no longer there we know that it is a two layer now only thing is as the you go up the amount of mucin uh, concentration will go down so when you have disturbance of that you will have dry eye so i think dry eye is the most probably the most uh, boring topic because uh, people are uh, keep on talking about it and uh, I, like uh, in uh, i then after my graduation for the past 20 22 years i found that we have we don't have a proper answer to the dry eye we don't know whether we are actually calling it correct also because it's basically we know that there is some pathology and uh, there is some exaggerated inflammation probably and not everything is inflammation at all so i won't go into the other details but i think it is important that whenever you see a patient who is posted for a surgery whether it's a cataract or any other surgery for that matter look under the slit lamp a uh, lot of uh, uh, surgeons we are surgeons especially who are uh, 25 30 years old men who have 25 30 years of experience they they relegate that job to the uh, juniors and uh, unless you look at carefully you will not be able to miss the you will be missing the subtle finds of findings of dry eye for example this patient looks pretty perfectly normal but if you put a stain and see you can see that there are multiple punctate uh, staining areas so just put a stain and see just to see two things one is the tear break up time second is uh, the punctate uh, staining whether it is there it's important for uh, retinal surgery as well as cataract surgery then if you have some pathology you go for other investigations depending on tear break up time non invasive tear break up time mebography and uh, stuff like that and nowadays there is a lot of talk about this uh, various devices which look at the mebumin secretions so being a, a hospital which does not have a lot of resources uh, in investing in uh, huge instruments like these we just use the auto refractometer and uh, with uh, tying up with a guy in iit we found that we can actually calculate the num- area of gland loss very easily with a simple software and we did a small study on uh, quite a few asymptomatic patients and a lot of symptomatic patients with dry eye and found that among asymptomatic people very small percentage has got some mgd mebumin gland loss while in even in the symptomatic population uh, the amount of people with significant mebumin gland disease or mebumin loss is not even 10% 10 uh, even if you take the highest degree it will be 10 plus 3 for 13% so there is a lot of hype around this uh, this thing 
I'm not saying that uh, mebumin gland disease is non-existent. It is definitely there. And uh, the various new treatments definitely gives uh, a good response to it. But the thing is, it is definitely overhyped. I think if you look at some of the population-based studies, we know that around 65 uh, to 70 percent of Indians have MGD. So it's important for any surgeon to, to look at this uh, carefully to, to avoid this. And if you have disease like this, obviously it has to be treated. If it's a mild MGD, you can carry on with the surgery procedure. So uh, when I see uh, the cornea surgeon versus a retina surgeon, cornea surgeon is very finicky. If you, even if you see a small spot on the cornea, they are bothered about uh, dry eye, systemic inflammatory disease and all that. While retina surgeons, especially quite a few senior surgeons, they uh, bombard the cornea with a lot of antibiotics, steroids, NSAIDs and everything. And even though we are treating the same organ, we have very different perspective of the eye. So I think there is a concept called optimization of the ocular surface before uh, cataract surgery. So before cataract surgery, if you have pre-existing dry eye, you treat it as, but as much as possible. And then if you do the cataract surgery, the results are better. Not the visual results also may be better, but most importantly, the symptoms of the patient would be much less. So there are treatment recommendations in the dry eye. Like if you have, uh, if even if you don't see a punctate staining, you see some evidence of dry eye, you can use the artificial tears. Basically, a lot of, especially a lot of people, city uh, people, they have this micronutrient deficiency, which can be corrected by using a uh, higher dose of uh, multivitamins along with uh, Osmega. That is, uh, I don't have any financial interest, but uh, Omega-3 fat acids are helpful in dry eye. But if you have a more substantial amount of dry eye, I think you need to investigate. There are a lot of avenues to investigate. I'm not, uh, this is, uh, actually this talk is not uh, within that purview. Uh, but you have a lot of uh, things that can be done. But if you have very severe dry eye like this, you have to do a systemic evaluation thoroughly and rule out a connective tissue disorder and then think of any treatment. So I'll just say that among the different lubricants that is available, CMC is slightly better because it is mucoadhesive. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, Sustain Ultra and uh, Sustain Balance these are much better or seem to be better compared to other lubricants because uh, it has certain agents which has got HP got sticks on to the hydrophobic sites and keeps it on the surface for a longer period of time. Again, I don't have any financial interest. Uh, these are uh, some studies which say that uh, combination of HA and uh, CMC if it is used preoperatively, it is helpful in the uh, prevention of dry eye symptoms in the patient. This is well documented in the case of cataract surgery. And when I got this topic, I saw that it is relevant for retinal surgery also. This is published in IJO from Iran, I believe. It's a randomized control study, prospective, pretty well conducted. And they have seen that uh, this non-invasive beauty levels are still decreased in people in whom the surface is not optimized. There are a lot of drugs which were available. Like in rabapamide is very well used in uh, Japan, but unfortunately it's not available in India. Rebacer was available, but I would, after COVID it has disappeared. In uh, certain situations, if you have a large epithelial defect and it's refusing to heal, you can use autologous serum. Autologous serum uh, has a lot of growth factors and it is definitely helpful in the, in the, in the especially in diabetic vitrectomies when you have a persistent epithelial defect. I use it pretty often. Uh, nowadays, I think when we used to do belt buckle very frequently, this was very, very common, but nowadays it is very infrequent. A demonstrative picture of a patient who had a use of uh, the serum drops over a period of time, it healed. And this, uh, the last picture is the one that shows that uh, this is a patient who had a uh, surgery done and a trigeminal nerve palsy, which was detected later. And then the patient had to undergo something called a corneal neurotization in which the nerves, supraorbital nerve is directed into the cornea and uh, the nerve supply can be restored. In bad cases, you can go for an amniotic membrane transplantation or a tarsorophy to get it healed. So if you if you are not closing the conjunctiva properly, especially if it is folded, sometimes this uh, pyogenic granuloma or sometimes stenosis can occur. Delen is a common occurrence. It usually disappears with uh, lubricants. And if it's not disappearing, you put a uh, ointment and pass the eye. 
This is a patient who had a cataract surgery done some time ago and that I was I, I think we are not aware of the reason. The patient told that she underwent a laser treatment and after which uh, she has some complaints. So she, when we saw that the patient had a real corneal thinning and this is a corneal melt the patient had is uh, bad rheumatoid arthritis when we did the workup we found that all the inflammatory par parameters and the CCP RA factor ESR CRP everything were way high. And uh, for the dry eye part, we gave preservative free lubricant, uh, put a plug, gave systemic steroids for the immediate uh, control of the disease and we found that it healed uh, inconsequentially. Scleral uh, thinning can occur. That is, as Madam was telling, uh, the surgically induced necrotic scleritis is a very, very uh, painful condition it is so irritating to the patient and sometimes it can be get unmasked by any surgery for that matter and the vitrectomy is no exception uh, sometimes uh, i think previously some 20 years ago we didn't know exactly what it is now we there is more and more evidence to suggest that it is uh, due to an underlying collagen vascular disease and with systemic and inflammatory therapy usually it settles down and obviously the local treatment is very important and very rarely you are unfortunate to get this scleritis, that is an infective scleritis is a disastrous complication. Sometimes very rarely it can ha occur, but you know that sclera is a relatively a vascular organ and like uh, osteomyelitis, you have to treat it for a long period of time. You, Whenever you see this pus along with the nodules there, you have to open it, make sure that all the scleral uh, abscess are de-roofed do a betadine wash, give systemic antibiotic, uh, better that the patient is admitted and given and topicals also. And quite often it, it heals to the, it heals with that sort of treatment. Uh, I, my talk has not been comprehensive, but I would uh, conclude saying that most of the conjunctival and corneal problems are largely preventable. I think I make a special emphasis for the dry eye and dry eye, if you uh, optimize the ocular surface and uh, do the procedure, most of the irritations of the patient can be taken care of. And uh, early management of the complications definitely can result in a very good outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anil, for that very nice presentation. We have three more minutes. If there are any questions from the audience, we'll be glad to answer. If not, let me thank all my co-instructors for the wonderful presentations and for and let me thank all of you for being here with us today. Thank you very much.